Everything seems to be okay. Cooperative Legacy Project interview number 80, December, December, June 20th, 2007. We're visiting with Bob Ullum, former member of the Board of Directors of the Farmers Union Oil Company at Flandreau and the Farmers Union Central Exchange. Bob, where and when were you born? I was born in Sioux Falls, uh, May 13th, 1932. Uh, and uh, where was your family originally from? Well, my family has uh, always been in South Dakota. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather farmed north of Flandreau, and that's where my dad grew up. And then uh, my dad went to painting in Sioux Falls. He was a painting contractor mm -hmm. and, and uh, stayed there till. Uh, the winter of 1940, and then uh, my uncle moved off the farm up here, and Dad moved on it. Okay. Um, what was your father's name? Glenn. Okay. You want to talk about him a little bit? What sort of a guy was he? Well, uh, he was a farmer at heart. He uh, used to have uh, purebred hogs and one thing and another when he was young and then uh, he was in the First World War. He was in the cavalry Ooh. and uh, <laughs> it seems kind of funny to talk about cavalry in a war but in the First World War there was a lot of cavalry. And uh, then he, uh, after he got out of the service, then he went into painting and continued that until uh, the lead and the paint started getting to him. So that's when uh, my uncle decided to, to uh, quit farming and moved to California and so dad, we moved up on my uncle's farm and, and uh, I own that farm today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what was your uh, mother's name? Uh, my mother's name was Esther Kuhn, and uh, her folks were originally farmers, but then he became a depot agent for the Milwaukee Railroad. Traveled all over the United States, practically. Okay, different depots and so on. Yep, right. Okay. And uh, he uh, retired from the railroad, so... Uh, uh, he, we found, uh, we were in Pagosa Springs a couple of years ago and, and, uh, we always do a little genealogy work when we're around and we knew my, my mother had a lot of information from Pagosa Springs and we found out that, uh, uh, my great grandparents are buried there on my grandma's side and, uh, also, that uh, my grandfather was a second depot agent at Pagosa Springs, Colorado. So, it was out in the Wild West, almost. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, want to talk about your mother a little bit? What sort of person was she? Well, my mother uh, uh, was, of course, she worked. Didn't work. She worked at home, which was plenty of work in those days. Farm -wise in those yeah, places. and uh, I can remember we lived in Sioux Falls over on the east side of Sioux Falls. Dad built a new house across from the deaf mute school, and uh, I was born in that house, and that was back in 1932, and it was the Depression then, and uh, so I was born. I was born at home. My my uh, dad's sister delivered me, mm -hmm. and uh, then my dad. There was no painting then for him, and so the day I was born, he got a he got a call from the rock quarry in Sioux Falls uh, to go to work, and he went started work the next day for seven dollars and a half every two weeks. And I can remember mother and I, we would walk. Uh, things got better then after, you know, in a few years. And he got to painting again. My mother and I used to walk 
into the town of Sioux Falls from out mm -hmm. on the east side, which would have been oh well over a mile. Yeah. Walking into town and mother was um uh, was a pianist too. Ooh. She uh, she played for silent movies. Oh really? Really. Oh okay. And she played uh she played mostly by ear. She could play most anything. And at one time she had played in a dance band and but she had graduated from uh, music conservatory in Colorado, so so she was a very talented pianist. And she wanted to teach me to play the piano, but I was too stupid at that time, and I didn't learn. And I've always kicked myself for not learning to play the piano. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably more than one person like that. Right. So I suppose for you going to the movies was kind of a different experience. You did were you old enough? I wasn't old enough going to the at that time. They were still no. before the talking movies started. No, yeah. no, yeah. that was before my time, of course. But yeah. uh, my mother was uh, forty years old when I was born. Mm. Okay. And my sister was born five years later. So. Okay. Um. So, uh, you probably do you remember much in Sioux Falls before you moved up to the farm? Oh yes, I okay. I remember in Sioux Falls in those days. You mentioned well, uh, we used to get ice delivered uh, by Gert and Adams had an ice company in Sioux Falls, and mm -hmm. and they came around with a team of horses and a wagon, and we bought ice, you know. Uh, a couple of blocks ice, and we had a a refrigerator it was cooled by ice, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, a lot of I can remember the families around there, and the we used to kids play together a lot, mm -hmm. and we always had good times. We, I uh, I go to a movie once in a while, but not too often. And uh, usually I have to walk, but uh, you know we never wondered what we were going to do, and there wasn't any television or anything. I can remember listening to the radio. Mm -hmm. We would uh, listen, uh, had all the old time stories, Jack Armstrong and the Green Hornet, and <laughs> those type of of. Uh, Things on the radio. I remember mother listening to Ma Perkins on the radio. That was on still even later years when television had come in. Uh, uh, right. Because there wasn't an awful lot of television during the day, uh, daytime, not so many channels. Um, you have brothers and sisters? I have one sister. Mm -hmm. She's living down in Missouri now. And. Uh, she spent most of her life, she farmed, they, her and her husband farmed here and just out east of town and we used to work together on the farm until they sold out and moved to Oregon. And uh, she moved, uh, she moved then back to, uh, uh, she called me one time and asked me, uh, if uh, I could get her a place down in Arizona, she thought maybe she'd like to move down there. And we, we go down there in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. We have a mobile home down there. I said, well, we won't be down there till, till uh, early winter, so why don't you live in our place down there until you see how you like it? And uh, she stayed... Uh, there until about six years ago now and then she retired and moved to Costa Rica. Costa Rica? Right oh. and uh, I helped her move down there and uh, then we uh, she rented a house until she got one built. Uh, she built a new house down there and all of the work down there is done by hand. 
and a lot of jungle there. She built her house kind of out in the jungle, and uh, <laughs> they cleaned, cleared it all land all by hand. Did uh, mixed all the cement by hand for the house, and it. Uh, they're a little backward down there. Uh, it's a poorer country too. Mm -hmm. But she went down there because it was uh, cheaper to live down there and everything. And and uh, she'd been down there once or twice and liked the climate. Uh, you don't need uh, furnace and the, you don't need air conditioning. There, she's up a little high enough that. Uh, it's warm in the winter and cool in the, cool, well, about 84 degrees somewhere in there mm -hmm. most of the time. Mm -hmm. It's about the high. So, she isn't too far from the, the west coast, so it gets ocean breezes too. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's my only sibling. Yep. So, um, um, let's see here. You moved, uh, your, the family moved up here then to, to, um, uh, the farm at Flandreau in 1940? Yep. That was the winter of 1940. Okay. Uh, it was in December. Mm hmm So, uh. We've been up here a good many years now. You said uh, earlier bef before we turned on the recorder that you remembered uh, uh, when Pearl Harbor was attacked. What were you doing then? You were eight years old, was it? Somewhere in that Canada's, neighborhood, yeah. eight or nine, yeah. I forget yeah. which. And uh, uh, I can remember listening to the radio of the attack and everything, and uh, I was cleaning out the brooder house that day, if I remember correctly, and and uh, it worried uh, me that maybe Dad would have to go to the war. Mm -hmm. But uh, he didn't, never had to, so he was old enough that he didn't have to. Yeah, yeah. How old was he at that time? Oh, mm, boy. He was... Uh, he was probably somewhere in his late 40s, mm -hmm. yeah. early yeah. 50s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They probably wouldn't have taken people that old. No, but, not... As, as, a, as an eight or nine-year-old, you wouldn't be assured yeah. of that. <laughs> okay. Um, what kind of a... Uh, what did you all raise on the farm then? Was it pretty much of a diversified? Oh population? yes, uh, we always raised. Uh, mother had chickens, and and dad had hogs and sheep and and cows. And mm -hmm. back then, uh, everybody milked, and it was by hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything was by hand practically. We started out with a. <clears throat> A 1940B John Deere tractor, and of course that couldn't pull anything but small equipment. Mm -hmm. Had a little two-bottom plow, which I still have, and uh, had a little disc and two-row corn planter. So it was uh, everything was done by hand back then. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you remember about, uh, what was life like during the war on the farm? Well, I don't know. Uh, I thought it was fine. It, mm -hmm. We had rationing yeah. back then. Yeah. I can remember that uh, there were stamps for gasoline and stamps for sugar and stamps for this and that and the other. Mm -hmm. And you were only allowed so much. Um, we uh, we all, we bought savings bonds, the saving stamps at the school. Mm -hmm. uh, I never cashed mine in. I kept them through the years, and when I started farming, 
I had enough money saved up from those savings bonds that I bought a, a brand new A. John Deere tractor and a four-row John Deere cultivator and a four-row John Deere corn planter. And that's when I started out farming in about 1953, I think it was. Okay, that would be hard to do today. Yeah, <laughs> with the, absolutely. With the equipment based on the Absolutely. <laughs> uh, school, do you go to a country school or do you go No, I town? never went to country school. I went to... Uh, uh, town school when we lived in Sioux Falls, and uh, then I, we were only a mile out in the country, and so mm -hmm. I went to town school yeah. here in Flandreau. Yeah, and was the, the numbers pretty much the same as at an elementary school in Sioux Falls as they were out, out here in Flandreau at that time for classes? Yes, they were yeah. approximately They probably the had same. multiple elementary schools in Sioux Falls. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, they did then. and. Yeah. And they certainly do now. My old school in Sioux Falls had got torn down. Mm -hmm. And my old grade school here in town, uh, it was torn down here a few years ago. And also the high school yeah. was torn down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was uh, school like here? Well, in Sioux Falls, and what was it? Was it, was it really different, the kids and so on, from Sioux Falls to Flandreau? in those days? Or was, well, was Sioux Falls more of a rural town in those days? It was more rural, yeah. It, uh, we we lived practically on the edge of town out there. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we were off of uh, East 10th Street on Mabel Avenue. Mm -hmm. And and from the Deaf Mute School, which was on the other side of the street, from there on east there wasn't anything but farms. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and... Uh, uh, I can uh, remember uh, I had a friend, Elsiane O'Connor, and uh, it was her brother who was in politics and whatnot, mm -hmm. and uh, riding a horse out there in the country, and, mm -hmm. and Joe Foss's folks, we used to buy potatoes from them, they lived out just a little further east, mm -hmm. so uh, actually... Uh, there wasn't any really any difference between the kids there and yeah. and uh, here. And uh, and back in those days, uh, what were was your family once you moved up here to Flandreau? Were they um, members of uh, farm? Was Farmers Union here then? Uh, we didn't belong to the Farmers Union at that time, and I don't know. It had to. Well, the, the co-op was started in about 37, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. Did, were they, did they patronize the co-op? Uh, we didn't to begin with. Uh, uh, Dad was friends with a fellow that uh, worked for uh, another oil station in mm -hmm. town. In fact, my uncle had owned an oil station in mm -hmm. town. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, we didn't... Uh, start patronizing our co-op here in town until uh, well after I'd started farming uh, my dad's friend that had worked for another oil station he started delivering fuel for the co-op and that's how we got started uh, mm -hmm. patronizing the co-op mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I always bought everything from the co-op. Everything I could buy from the co-op, I bought from the co-op. And uh, I can remember the old uh, green uh, power fuel, they used to call it, that we put in the John Deere. And, and uh, then we went to gasoline burning tractors and finally went to diesel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you you did you graduate from high school here then? Yes, I did. I graduated from Flandreau High School. Okay, and that would have been about what nineteen fifty. That was nineteen fifty. I graduated. Okay. And uh, 
that's just about the time the Korean War was uh, yep. going. Right. Um, did you, had they, well, they reinstituted the draft then, did they? Or? Oh, yes, they had a and draft. It was still in place, I suppose. It was still in place, yeah. absolutely. And uh, um, I fully expected to go to the service. And uh, I did take a physical and found out that I was, well, I knew beforehand that I was allergic to wool. And so they said they could either send me to Southwest Pacific or classify me 4F. And they did classify me 4F. Mm -hmm. So I never served in the military. Mm -hmm. Did you discover the wool allergy raising sheep on the farm? <laughs> well, no. I... <clears throat> I discovered it wearing a lot of wool long Ooh, underwear. Yeah, yeah. Well, that would do it. And I spent two or uh, about two weeks in the hospital with uh, oh. infection in both legs from it. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, let's see. And where did you uh, meet your wife? Uh, at the roller skating rink up at Lake Camel. Her uh, folks farmed uh, just east of Lake Camel, mm -hmm. and uh, they had uh, four girls, and they always went to the roller skating rink, and I spent a lot of time at the roller skating rink, and that's how we happened to meet. Okay, what was her name? Lois Tompkins. Mm -hmm. uh, her dad is one of the Tompkins that... Uh, built the alumni center at the college there in Brookings. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, when, were, when did you get married? We got married in October of 11th of 1953. Okay. All right. Um, let's see here. Kids? I have, we have four children. Mm -hmm. and my oldest son is a minister. He's living in Iowa. Okay, what denomination? Presbyterian. Okay. Uh, he's a pastor at the church in Algona, Iowa now. Okay. And then uh, my son Steve um, used to farm until the tough times came, and he wound up uh, selling out and... Uh, he still lives out on the farm place, but he uh, sells cars in Sioux Falls. Makes a lot more money than mm -hmm. he ever did farming. What kind of cars is he selling? Saturns. Saturns, okay. Oh, you can sell Saturns and Hummers, and mm -hmm. then they've got Pontiacs and yeah, just the Cadillacs. Just off of 12th Street right. There. Yeah. Okay. Um, is that all the kids? No, then I have... Uh, my oldest daughter is Linda, and she lives down in Chandler, Arizona. And then I have a daughter, Brenda, and she and her family live down in uh, Colorado, just north of Elizabeth, Colorado. Okay. Where's that at in Colorado? Well, it's just on the uh, southern edge of uh, Denver, and then to the east, about mm -hmm. 15 miles. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Um, how did you uh, get involved with the co-op here in town? When, when did that happen? Well, I... Um, you said like, you started patronizing... Like I say, well, I pat patronized the co-op, and... And... Uh, I didn't think it was... A very progressive outfit, really. They were very conservative and whatnot. And uh, I, uh, I've had an opportunity to run for the board, and I did, and I got elected. And I guess I served probably twenty-six years or so on that co-op board. So when did you get elected then? Ah, uh, boy. I can't even remember what year it was. Uh, uh, about. Oh, it would have been in the, probably in the 70s somewhere. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, 
What uh, what kind of uh, issues were you dealing with at the co-op in those in those days? Well, uh, like back then, it was a small it was a small co-op. Mm -hmm. We uh, had never grossed a million dollars back then, and uh, we I can remember uh, when floater fertilizer spreaders first came out and uh, the manager wanted one and we had a meeting one night and the board discussed that thing for hours whether we could afford a floater and I think they were 40 45,000 mm -hmm. at that time and uh, I finally told him I said well We've talked about this long enough. If we're not going to buy one, I'm going to go home. And I started to leave. No, oh, wait a minute there. And so then the boys, they got down to business and we ordered a fertilizer spreader. That was the first spreader. Uh, we'd had smaller, you know, tractor pulls uh, before that. But that was the first big one. And that... Uh, I can remember the last one that uh, I was on the board that we bought, and that thing was a uh, quarter of a million dollars. So Prices have changed. Right. Yeah. And uh, through the years, uh, then we gradually started to grow, and we finally decided as a board, we, we talked about it, uh, whether or not we should, how much we should be in. We were in tires, we were in batteries, we were in lawnmowers, we were in, uh, of course, fuel and uh, fertilizer and chemicals and seed. And we finally decided that perhaps we needed to uh, get rid of some of that stuff and go to the things that we were good at and made our money in. And uh, we were cramped right in town. Our, the, the station was right on the end of Main Street. There wasn't any room for expansion. There wasn't any room for anything. We had our bulk fuel uh, in the south edge of town. We had uh, a fertilizer building there. And uh, it was, at that time, Flandre had a railroad, and we could get railroad cars to fertilizer in. And that was good. But uh, we finally decided we needed to build. And so we went... The, the town wanted us out on the, on the west end of the town there. They had some land there that they wanted to sell us. And so we bought that land down there. And we decided the first thing we should build was a fertilizer plant. So we built a modern fertilizer plant down there. And... Uh, still ran our business out of the co-op and the uptown. And then uh, as we as we began to make more money and business picked up, then uh, we got uh, out of the lawnmower business, we got out of the tire business, uh, we built uh, uh, an new sea store down there by the fertilizer plant <clears throat> and of course we were an LP gas too and we put in bigger LP tanks and of course we went to liquid fertilizer and, and uh, the business has continued to grow since then uh, I don't know how many floaters we've got now, but we've got a lot of them, and spraying equipment. And, but uh, I can remember when we broke our first million dollars. 
I, uh, I was very happy and uh, everybody else was too. We finally broke that million dollar barrier. And mm -hmm. From then on, why we've continued. Mm -hmm. what, did, uh, what did you like about cooperatives? You, your family hadn't been involved with them before, but uh, did, was there something you saw that you liked about working and being a member of a cooperative? Well, yes. I always, I like the co-op for several reasons. One, uh, it was a quality product. And number two, you got what you paid for. I mean, I heard a lot of horror stories about companies that would um, short their patrons on on uh, chemical, on on fertilizer and so on. I never worried at the co-op. I always got what I paid for. And uh, we tried to hire good managers, uh, good help, and uh, we got good service. And besides that, uh, we owned it. Mm -hmm. And so I... Uh, I, uh, for for all those reasons, that's why I was a was a co-op member. Mm -hmm. Did you have uh, any, when you first got on the board? Did you have anybody who you kind of looked to as a as a good board member, uh, a, a good way to? to we do it? we had a lot of good board members. Uh, you still had some of the founding board members, didn't right? You, that right, we did. Uh, Henry Bell was. Uh, an excellent member of our board. Uh, um, Ingeman was another one. Uh, we had uh, 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 Doyle was on the board. He was one of the later members. Uh, Mel Jensen was one of the old time board members too. And uh, uh, we always uh, uh, we'd go to the uh, annual meeting in St. Paul. Uh, the, practically the whole board would go. Mm -hmm. And uh, we always got along great on the board. And, and uh, like I say, those a lot of those fellows, and they were all involved in the Farmers Union. And uh, I was too. I was involved with the with the uh, Farmers Union for years and years. And in fact, I don't know how long I've been a member, but uh, we uh, we had a good board to start with, and I think we've got a good board today. Some uh, boards over the years adopted term limits for board members. Usually if they did it, they did it for like a nine year thing. You obviously they didn't do that here, at least in the earlier years. Uh, no, you think they that didn't. Was a good thing or a bad thing to do for? They didn't then, and they still don't. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Uh, it's sometimes I think a person can serve on a board maybe too long, but uh, I I believe sincerely in term limits for our politicians anymore. And I never used to, mm -hmm. but uh, if you've got a good board member, um, fine, let him do his job, and when he thinks it's time to retire, he'll retire. Uh, I uh, I retired uh, when I uh, when I went on the uh, national board, the national cynics board, and I didn't feel that it was. Uh, fair to the other board members uh, for me being gone, although it was, you gained a lot of experience on those boards. Mm -hmm. I also served on, uh, for many, many years on our local conservation district board and also served on the state board. Mm -hmm. And uh, I retired from that board too when I, when I got enough other things when I, I had to be out of town a lot. And, mm -hmm. and then uh, about 16 years ago, we started going to Arizona for the winter. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course then I'm gone for 
three or four months in the winter time, and that's not. Then you can't be an effective member then either. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was the most difficult uh, issue you had to deal with when you were on the on the board? Uh, well. Was, was credit policy a problem here? Credit was always uh, uh, in in the eighties, and we we uh, we developed a credit policy. We worked with the bank and uh, uh, the farmers back then. They had to line up their finances ahead of time, and we didn't feel that we should be a bank mm-hmm. uh, if. A farmer couldn't get their money from a bank, then we didn't feel we should be lending them the money. Mm-hmm. That was a philosophy that went back to the 1930s, I think. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, credit got easy, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I can remember back in the 70s and early 80s, well, it was mostly in the late 70s, when uh, all the farm magazines were talking about the young tigers that were going out and buying land and mm-hmm. leveraging land and so on, and uh, and uh, a lot of those went broke, and they they took a lot of uh, a lot of businesses with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe expend, extending too much credit to right, one person. Right, right, yeah. and and. The banks are there for a reason, and the co-ops and the other businesses are there for a reason. But they're not there to extend credit. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have a 30-day credit policy, but yeah. Uh, yeah. but I always paid my bill at the end of every month. But we always had a we had a, a line of credit from the banks or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I've talked to some people who are on boards and. Uh, and they they said that sometimes uh, there was uh, they had to deal with an issue of maybe a board member expecting to get a little bit more favorable treatment from the from the co-op than than other other members got. Did, did you ever run into anybody like that around here? That uh, no, uh, we uh, had people who understood uh, cooperatives. And, we uh, of course there were complaints, you know that oh we didn't get our sp- our spray put on in time uh, and that guy over there got it ahead of us and he's a bigger farmer than we are but the list was made in the morning and the the guys went out and they they started in this territory and they would work that territory without running back and forth you know all over the country and but uh, we always got everybody serviced and Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, nobody that complained like that really had a complaint coming. Some of the guys that did complain got to be board members after a while, and and uh, they never got any favorable treatment either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how did issues change over time? Was it, was it, was there a, a significant difference in what kind of issues you're having to deal with from the beginning? Of course, you talked about being rather, uh, relatively small and expanding. Right, uh, and we, well, you know, we felt bad when we had to quit uh, tires and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, like I say, I love to buy everything from our local co-op, mm-hmm. but uh, we just couldn't... Uh, we were carrying a big inventory on tires, and we bought out the local Firestone dealer in town. And then we got, we had help in two or different places, and and uh, things they weren't co-op minded when because they were had been with the company of Firestone before that. And, and um, so we found that uh, it was best when we got everything located in one spot, and we could we could uh, take you see that the help was where they should be, when they should be, and but um, 
It was hard to quit, and other co-ops had the same problem of uh, quitting a lot of these things, downsizing or going together and growing, and mm -hmm. and uh, we, uh, but we finally we got rid of lawnmowers because the manager said, you know, people will get mad at us because their lawnmower doesn't work. And why create ill feeling for a lawnmower that just a few bucks? And so we got out of those. Mm -hmm. And it was things like that. And and we uh, went into the items that we could handle better and do a good job at. Mm -hmm. Looking back, what do you think the biggest uh, peril for a smaller co-op is? Uh, you, you started out certainly as a smaller co-op. Well, they all have to grow. In this day and age, you got to grow or you perish. And we're, you know, the farmers have got the same thing anymore. Uh, you either have to be small or you got to be large. And we've got, we've got a farmer here now that's eighteen thousand acres, and they're just we've got. We've got other ones that are bigger yet. And, uh, you know, you've got to have help and you've got to have this and that and the other. And those big farmers require, uh, they've got a, a big, you know, they're, they're, their operating expenses are in the millions rather than. So um, credit is one thing that that uh, we've always stressed at the co-op and and I think uh, you can see it over the state that a lot of them credit did eat them up yep. and uh, others uh, have grown we haven't um, we haven't gone out and bought out any other co-ops yet we tried when I was on the board to uh, to buy the co-op, uh, it was the Land of Lakes co-op over in Pipestone, mm -hmm. and we tried to buy that, but uh, it was owned by uh, corporate back then, Land of Lakes, and mm -hmm. uh, they didn't didn't want to sell. Mm -hmm. And you know, Cenex corporate, if they owned a plant, it was always for sale to another co-op, mm -hmm. and. Uh, but this one wasn't, and I knew uh, that was when I was on the on the Senex board, and I knew the guys that. Uh, but no, they just didn't want to sell that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Did so you, have, uh, you probably had patrons over in Minnesota from here at Flanders. Yes, we do. Your trade territory would extend over there. Yep. Yeah. Um. When did you decide to run for the for the Senex Regional Board? Well, I uh, when Roy Copperwood retired or was going to retire, I think. I uh, let's see. It was before Roy. Um, Roy was let's see. Roy was retired after I got on the board. Mm. Uh, but um, it was when. Um, What's your name from Howard uh, Mortensen? Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't either. Who was the other board member then? It was right in that neighborhood yeah. when I yeah. got on the board. Yeah. You had like uh, several people that ran at the same time there. There were, I think, three or four of us that ran. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got elected on the... I can't remember if it was the first or second ballot. Yeah. Was there a lot of campaigning that you had to do? Well. To go out and visit co-ops and so on? Uh, not like it is today. Yeah. Uh, there was campaigning and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I was fairly well known in, in the co-op circles back then, uh, or the Farmers Union and whatnot. Mm -hmm. and so uh, I... Uh, 
I decided to run, and uh, and I did, and like I say, I got elected, and and that was a good education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I rec would recommend anybody that had the time uh, to run for that board. It it does take time, mm -hmm. and uh, but we traveled all over the country. We we uh, uh, I understand a little bit now about. Uh, Royal refineries, and at that time we were drilling our own oil wells and whatnot, and and uh, fertilizer plants and and whatnot. Uh, it was a great education, and uh, we had uh, a lot of good board members, and uh, it's not as big a business as it was it's a bigger business now than it was then I was in the 80s and mm -hmm. so uh, um, it's uh, it was a good education I enjoyed it I still I still have friends on that board we uh, we went to Portland this winter for the 75th anniversary of of uh, well, when when Senex first started, it's it's Senex Harvest States now, but uh, and they they uh, had all the past board members there, and uh, they were all there, but they were living but two, mm -hmm. and uh, so I thought that was pretty good that uh, there were that many of those board members there, and I still have some of those board members. Uh, I go see them once in a while, and mm -hmm. they've been to see me, and and uh, sometimes get together down in Arizona. And... Um, let's see here. What what kind of issues were you dealing with while you were on the on the? On the well, that was the time when uh, the. Uh, uh, we worked with Land of Lakes with the joint venture. Mm -hmm. Was that Daryl Moses? Was Daryl was was president? was president then, right? And then uh, Farmland too was uh, making overtures to us to uh, to uh, go in with them. And, uh, we joint ventured with Land Lakes, and and we had a lot of the same philosophy as Land Lakes had. Uh, a little different deal with dairy and so on, but but uh, when we uh, we uh, joint ventured uh, the feed, the seed, the chemical, and the fertilizer, and. Uh, and that worked well. That worked well. And uh, we talked a lot with uh, farmland, but <clears throat> farmland we could see had a they had a lot of debt. And even back in the eighties. Back then, absolutely. And we just didn't feel comfortable. And I. Think had we tried that before we were really running good with the rest of it that we probably might have failed with with that venture too, and so we didn't uh, we didn't do anything with them, but of course now we own their share of the uh, oil refinery in McPherson and. Uh, we're providing well we we got a lot more territory than we had then uh, they also had managers serving on their board of directors absolutely they did uh, and uh, that was a policy that our board did not like our board was all farmers and they were all working farmers and uh, we didn't uh, we didn't like that idea at all. And uh, you know, all of our managers have uh, 
have come into the system from within the system. You know, Daryl uh, Daryl's dad was uh, one of the original founders, mm -hmm. and uh, I was on the board when when Daryl retired, and it was at that time it wasn't as easy a job managing as it was before. I mean, the business was getting larger and larger and larger, and uh, and uh, we were out in um, Bozeman, Montana, and uh, we were staying in a in a hotel there, and and it was the most serene place you could imagine. And that's when Daryl decided that he was going to hang it up, and uh, he gave us his resignation, and we were all. Sorry to see him resign, but uh, but uh, he'd been through the wars, and time to take it easy. I interviewed him, and he talked about uh, what had happened to his predecessors, and he, mm -hmm. he he wanted to enjoy some retirement rather than dying shortly right, afterwards. Right, right. Yep. So, um, and you were on the on the board for how long? I was on the board for three years. Three years. Mm -hmm. And. I guess, um, well, I guess I won't get into that, but uh, there were a couple reasons why <clears throat> I uh, I had uh, advanced a little bit too fast in the company. I was up to uh, secretary treasurer, and I think I stepped on some feet getting there. If I'd had to do it again, I I wouldn't have done that. But uh, there was some board reorganization, and and uh, there were a couple of factions on the board, and uh, and the uh, farmers union faction took over the board, and and uh, uh, like I say, I I uh, probably should have not taken the position right away, and, mm -hmm. but I did, and uh, then there were, uh, there were some bad feelings, and, and uh, uh, there was some work to get me defeated, but uh, I didn't like the politics either. I don't I don't like all this crap going on all the time, and so mm -hmm. when my term, three-year term was up and I got defeated, well, I went back and I was happy, and I've been happy ever since. And but I, that's one thing I don't like is is the politics that was going on. Yeah, the internal type stuff. Yep. Yeah. Uh, during your time uh, on the board, were there some other board members that stood out for you? You talked about keep continuing to communicate with some of the people mm -hmm. you served with. Who were some of them that you thought really did a good job? Well, John Brosty from North Dakota. Mm -hmm. uh, North Dakota was an excellent uh, state. They uh, um, then in Minnesota. Uh, uh, Larson, one of the solid board members, uh, who was chairman of the board, uh, he uh, he was also with the insurance, and uh, excellent board member, uh, one of the old time guys, and uh, Dale Johnson from uh, out in Idaho. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, Elroy Webster, of course, uh, uh, was, of course, became chairman of the board. And uh, so I've, uh, I keep, I see those guys every so often. Olson from uh, North Dakota was elected the same time I was, but 
he's had some medical problems uh, over the last few years. He wasn't able to be there uh, yeah. in Portland. Yeah. yeah, he got an award at the National Farmers Union Convention. I think he was in a wheelchair. At yeah, time. right. Yeah. But uh, and uh, so we've we've several of us. Uh, we see each other now and then. And um, looking at cooperatives in general, uh, how do you, how would you assess the current situation of cooperatives in South Dakota in this general region? Uh, there's been some changes certainly have been happening. I think uh, the the co-ops that I know of are are healthy and. Um, uh, I think most of them have found their niche, and uh, a lot of them, um, like the Britain Co-op, has certainly grown over the years. They've, uh, you know, they've uh, consolidated with several of the co-ops around. Mm -hmm. I think you can get to the point where maybe you get too large, but. Uh, um, I think uh, if you can, you know, if you can uh, get together with a co-op that's close, uh, it's good for both. It's good for both co-ops. Mm -hmm. um, as we go, you know, right around here, there isn't any smaller towns like Egan never had a co-op. They had a co-op elevator, but mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want to get into the elevator business, so we never got involved in that, and uh, we, like I say, we tried to get Pipestone, but uh, Elkton has seemed like they've been getting along pretty good up there, and then you go to the west, we haven't got anybody except 40 miles away at Madison, or 30 miles away at Madison, mm -hmm. and they're doing pretty good, always have, but uh, but there aren't any other co-ops that are close enough that we felt we could go together with. Mm -hmm. um, the, the speaker at last year's co-op month banquet uh, uh, referred to cooperatives as a market correction tool, in other words, uh, if not, uh, to, I guess to put it another way, uh, uh, as a bit form of business that would keep other businesses honest. Uh, uh, do you think that's still true? I think so. Uh, we always tried. We had to to price our product to make a to make a profit, mm -hmm. and a lot of people didn't understand that a co-op had to make a profit. But you got to make a profit, or you can't. You can't. Uh, uh, buy new equipment, you can't do this, you can't do the other. And uh, we always felt that uh, the help, we paid the help well and paid our manager well, mm -hmm. and uh, that all takes money. And so, yes, we kept our products as low as we possibly could to still make a profit. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the... Uh, uh, a lot of the farmers who never belong to co-ops uh, don't realize it, but, you know, your earnings are saved. And when I was on the board, we we tried to, we started paying off the 90-year-olds. The that was as low as we could go then in age. Well... I turned 75 this year, and I got my earnings. And it was a big chunk of money, mm -hmm. a big chunk of money. And it didn't hurt me a, a bit because I wasn't paying any more than, than I paid anywhere else, but my money was building up. And I don't think I was when I, this, this year, when I got my money because... Uh, there are some of the younger farmers that are that are uh, a lot bigger than I ever was when I farmed, but at one time I was the biggest shareholder in the co-op. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so that 
that's important and uh, uh, I see some of these people that don't patronize co-ops that uh, my they could have a nice nest egg someday. Um, how important do you think cooperative education is? Well that's something that that some of the you know the the bigger co-ops uh, uh, the, I mean, the regionals are doing now is is having the young, uh, getting to the young people, and I I think uh, co-op uh, education is quite important. And uh, you know, uh, it used to be that we were a, a big family, the uh, with the farmers union and so on and so forth, the kids belonged to that. They went to camp. They they knew about cooperatives, mm -hmm. but today's youth don't know about it as much as they used to. And I think it's important. To, education is important at every level. Um, and I guess you kind of alluded to that a little bit. Do you think the cooperative members today are as aware of the, the history and as loyal perhaps to the institution as maybe the earlier generation may have been? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I, like I said, I tried to buy everything for the co-op. I didn't price anywhere else. I bought from the co-op. And... Um, you know, people will go out of their way to buy gas somewhere. I always buy my gas at the co-op uh, because it's part of that money is going to come back to me. It's a few cents. Maybe you can get it three or four cents less somewhere else, but I've never done that, and I'm not going to start now. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've known uh, board members that were good board members that today... Uh, they buy where they can get it the cheapest. They buy their fertilizer the cheapest. Uh, uh, they'll buy their chemical where they can get it the cheapest. But uh, that's not the way to to build a co-op. No, and it doesn't perhaps set a really good example for the non-board right. member. Right. So you never saw me loading up anything other than before we got uh, seed corn and stuff, I I would buy seed corn somewhere else because we didn't have it. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> I I tried to be very loyal. Yeah. Um, one of the issues that uh, that uh, some of the folks I've interviewed has ta have talked about with regard to, at least to the uh, to to the uh, cooperative um, oil companies. And elevators is the subject of regionalization. I don't know if it's if there's much of it around here, but in some areas, the region, local co-op members have traded their shares in the local co-op in for um, additional shares of the regional, mm. and then the regional basically runs the local. No, that doesn't hasn't happened around here. Yeah. yeah. No, we've always we've always been in full command of our local co-op, and. <clears throat> Um, that was always Senek's philosophy was not to mm -hmm. run a business. Mm -hmm. When they might, we bought a lot of businesses when I was on the board, and uh, we would we would run them until there was a co-op that would, could take it over. And the minute they could take it over, we sold it to them. Mm -hmm. and the field staff worked toward that goal. Yeah, and. The regional today, like in Sioux Falls, we own the come and goes and some of those. Uh, but um, we don't have a local co-op that can handle them. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a little bit too big, you know. Yeah. And, and we have, see, we had a surplus of fuel at one time and whatnot. And that's when... Uh, Senex got into the uh, the convenience stores, the big truck stops and stuff, mm -hmm. to get that business too, and we've been very successful at it. Yeah. Um, 
How do you feel about instances where uh, a private uh, operator may be getting fuel from Cenex and uses the Cenex logo uh, uh, on his business? Well, I'm not uptight about that. Um, most of the time they don't use the logo. Uh, occasionally they do, but uh, then uh, we've got a product to sell and we've started selling oil now to we bought out some oil companies in the cities mm -hmm. and we're starting to, there's one or two companies now that's that's buying our brand of oil and grease and I think that's fine we got a product to sell and uh, as long as uh, as uh, there's, you know, their price differential isn't going to be anything, you know, mm -hmm. for a penny or two. I wouldn't walk across, this, I wouldn't drive Sioux Falls to get it. Um, so I, I don't know. Uh, in this day and age, I think there's some of that stuff we got to do. Uh, you got to think long and hard about it, but there's some of these things that have to be done mm -hmm. and I think we're going to see we're going to see a lot of change coming down the pike I think in, in what do you think the biggest challenge facing co-ops today is well the biggest challenge is the keep the farmers on the land that's the biggest challenge because uh, <clears throat> uh, the bigger you get as a farmer you can go out 100 miles away or so and you can, uh, what are you going to bid on? Give me a bid on this or give me a bid on that or give me a bid on something else. And uh, that's going to be our biggest problem is is keeping farmers on the, on the land. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your take on the development? And of course, it's kind of mostly happened here in the 1990s, from beginning of the 1990s and then through today, uh, the development of the uh, uh, alternative energy uh, the, uh, ethanol in South Dakota and farmer-owned ethanol plants. Well, so far they've been a great thing. I'm concerned that that someday ethanol isn't going to be the answer, and. Um, I've, I started burning ethanol when it was first available. We, we got it in as quick as we could here, and I have burned it ever since. And I'm still burning it. And now they've got it so that I can burn it when I head to Arizona and back. But uh, uh, you see a lot of complaints now, and you hear it on the radio, and you hear it on TV, and so on with the with ethanol. Uh, it's the it's run the price of corn up, and uh, it's going to make this cost more, and that cost more, and something else cost more, and um, well, I agree with with the biodiesel and with the uh, ethanol I don't see why we shouldn't be running our cars on 100% ethanol but in the long run we're gonna have to either make our ethanol out of a different substance beside corn or something mm -hmm. Now there are uh, at least a couple of the co-ops in South Dakota that have, uh, that have put in blender pumps where the consumer can choose 20% or 30% mm -hmm. as well as E85. So uh, that, that may be a possibility too. Um, during uh, your time on, uh, on cooperative boards, what achievement are you most proud of? Well, I think the growth has been the thing that I'm most proud of mm -hmm. and uh, like when uh, we were we were working with Land O'Lakes I happened I was on that uh, 
committee that that worked with that and and to me we did some good things and uh, so I've been I I was tell you we were so happy when we broke our first million at our local co-op after years and years and years and uh, the growth that has taken place there uh, people said they wouldn't they wouldn't uh, buy gas from us anymore, fill our car up, because we were on the end of town. We weren't on the end of Main Street anymore. And we picked up more fuel business than we ever had before. And uh, so uh, those things uh, are things that I am proud of. Okay, and... Uh, uh you mentioned uh, spending some time in Arizona. What else are you doing these days? Well, I've got, uh, I own rental houses here in town. Okay. I have for years. Yep. And I, uh, I, uh, help, a na I help one neighbor uh, put his crop in in the spring and, and take it out in the fall. And uh, so other than the rentals and, and then working around home in the yards, I have big gardens, and uh, which I give most of the produce away, but I even have a garden in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And uh, so try to enjoy life a little now. Yeah. I told my wife uh, when we first started going to Arizona that... Uh, you know, uh, you see so many of these people that either farm all their life and retire and die the next year, yep. or one gets sick or the other gets sick and stuff. So even before I retired from farming, I started going to Arizona. And I said, we're going to go because maybe we got 10 years to do this. So we've been going down there. We have a our daughter and family is down there, so that's why we happen to be in Arizona. And uh, uh, we have uh, have been going down there for 15 years now. This will be 16 this fall. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're we're doing a little better than normal. Uh, what kind of advice would you give somebody who was, who was thinking about maybe... Uh um, running for a local co-op board, for example. Well, I I think you need to talk to the board members uh, if there's going to be an opening. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if there isn't, and you desperately want to be on the mm -hmm. run against somebody, that's fine too. I suppose it's more common maybe for a committee to go out and talk to somebody. And yeah, normally uh, there is a nominating yeah. committee, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think uh, talk to the people, talk to, you need to talk to employees, get a little idea of what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily that you're going to run, but that you, well, how is this going? How is that going? Uh, mm -hmm. How do you do this? How do you do that? And uh, uh, then go after it. I, I like I say, I wasn't a good politician, and I never, uh, I could have probably campaigned a lot harder than I did, but, uh, but you just need to go out and talk to the people. You know who the co-op uh, patrons are, and you need to talk to them, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and go in there with, it's a learning process. You don't go in and change the world in a day. Yep. Yep. Um, just a couple questions left. Uh, would uh, This is one I ask everybody. Would you describe yourself as an optimist or a pessimist? Well, I've always been an optimist. I... Um, I haven't found anybody who would admit to being a pessimist. Occasionally somebody will make a pessimistic statement at some point in the interview, but... I, um, 
I don't think, on the other side of the coin, I don't think that my kids, which are all adults and 50, the oldest one's 50-some years old now, but uh, I don't think that uh, their generation is going to be able to fall back on Social Security. I don't think it's going to be available. I don't think that... Uh, that uh, they are inheriting as good a country as we inherited. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, this thing in the, in the Middle East will never go away. Uh, we've got our border thing is, is going to make a tremendous difference in this country. Uh, we've got too many people in this country that aren't citizens and if we give them the right to vote, if we give them social security, stuff like that. Um, and I think we're going to see terrorism in this country. Uh, the Muslims feel that, uh, that an infidel, which is you and I, uh, anybody that isn't a Mormon is an infidel and should be killed. Uh, and, um, uh, even the mainliners, uh, you know, they, but the radicals are so far out that I think uh, for a lot of those reasons, we, uh, and I'm afraid that this country is going to go down the road towards socialism someday. They always do, seems like. Mm -hmm. Uh my grandfather and my father never asked, what will you do for me? Uh, they always did it themselves. And uh, I think today's world, we expect too much. We expect the government needs to do this for us. Or we expect the government needs to do some, uh, something for somebody else. We, um, I didn't inherit a lot of stuff. Everything I've got is, I've got the hard way. And uh, uh, I, I don't expect, uh, if I didn't have Social Security, uh, I'd have uh, an insurance policy that would take care of me medically and so on. And so I think uh, we... Someday the money's going to run out, I'm afraid. <clears throat> uh, you didn't grow up uh, during a depression. I was a little young to know what was going on in that depression. But my folks went without some of the food and some of the things so that I could have, when I was a baby, have, you know, the things that I needed. And... <clears throat> Uh, when I grew up and I started farming and I have, I never bought anything, we, we never bought anything for the house until we could afford to pay cash for it. We never, never owned a credit card, never owned any of that. And, um, now I've got, I don't know if you're still recording, but, but, um, I'm not the poorest person in the world. I'm not the wealthiest either. But um, I don't think, um, I don't think if we had a correction today uh, like we have had, I'm not sure how the younger people could handle it. Going, you know, I've got, got grandkids that uh, get married. they got to have all the all of the uh, things that we used to look forward to getting, uh, they have them right away, and they buy a nice house and stuff. And and uh, I don't know if they could handle a, a setback in the economy like we can. Mm -hmm. uh, I I still have a garden. There isn't a kid in the country hardly that knows how to grow a garden. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you wanted to mention before we get out of here? 
Well, you haven't asked about my grandkids. Okay, tell me about the And uh, I do have 10 of them. Mm -hmm. uh, they've all uh, been very good. I've got a, uh, they've all graduated from high school and, and uh, college with honors. Mm -hmm. And um, I have uh, I have my first great grandson now, as of last fall. So uh, I'm kind of I I've waited a long time for that great grandchild. <laughs> my uh, my oldest grandson was 29 when he got married, and he's he just graduated from. Uh, Palmer Chiropractic College. Mm. So, and uh, the other th other thing that I was very uh, happy with is when my my oldest son went into the ministry. Mm. Mm -hmm. He graduated from State College with a degree in microbiology and in uh, microbiology like to ministry three and a half years and. But uh, he was leaning when, and he was going to be a veterinarian, but uh, he couldn't get in Iowa State that one year, and so he thought he'd go another year to Brookings, and he wound up uh, going into the ministry. Okay. And uh, that was uh, a very happy occasion for me because I had considered going to the ministry at one time. Oh, okay. And I didn't, but I've uh, I served on the local church, and I've served on the state board for years, and and so I got the best of both worlds. Okay. We've been visiting with Bob Ullum. Thank you for participating in the Cooperative Legacy Project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.